morning. My name is Dr. Lori Baudino, and I'm doing collaborative check-ins today with Sharon Duncan, and she's a gifted educational specialist and consultant, and I'm really excited for her to be able to explore with us about the gifted population and maybe some of the myths that we experience and how to get that just right support for parents, whether it's socializing, school placement, homeschooling, it's a big topic right now. We've all been exposed and maybe whether we chose to or not, we've now been homeschooling for the past four months. So this is even more relevant to many across the board, but we do wanna talk about the gifted children as well and what that means. So thank you, Sharon, for being here. Thank you very much. I'm excited to be here. Can you share with us more about your role with families over the past years? <laughs> so I work with families and I work with educators. I work with schools and districts. Um, I work with psychologists and I even work with pediatricians. Basically what I do is I help them understand and meet the social, emotional, and educational needs of gifted and twice exceptional children. And it's a, it, I basically, I consider myself a professional problem solver. Um, I, I would like to explain the term, people have heard the term gifted, but people may not have understood Absolutely. the term. Yeah, that's definitely where we want to start. <laughs> so yeah. sometimes you will even see that as uh, the letter two and then an E after it in mm -hmm. literature. So two E refers to a child who is both gifted and they have one or more learning challenge on top of it. And those children are um, very unique in the respect that their needs are extraordinarily broad and very frequently giftedness can mask learning challenges mm -hmm. and learning challenges can mask giftedness and so for these children nothing is ever just right it's always too hard or too easy yeah. and it's just it's very it's a very difficult emotional space for them to live in fact, there are studies that show that while by the numbers, and, and I, I want to do finger quotes on this because I, I, I do put, I don't really think that the number game is the only way to play this or to look at this, but by the number game, gifted uh, individuals represent 2% of the population, but there are multiple studies that show that the um, dropout rate is 20%. 20% of the high school dropouts are actually gifted children. And these may in fact be uh, 2E, they may be gifted. I don't have data on that, but it's a, it's a very, I think it's the most unrecognized at-risk population in the school system. Thank you for saying that and, and for clarifying some of the information about it. There is this, you know, when we hear about giftedness and you and I were just recently talking about this, this idea of what does this name mean? Does it have a stigma to it? Does it separate kids? Does it mean your kids better or less than either direction? Right. And um, I love what you had said, and maybe you can touch upon it some more sure. about, you know, rather than stripping away the label and saying, let's call it something else, um, how to just redefine that label. Yeah, I think that, well, just as a personal philosophy for me, I actually think, um, you know, a rose is a rose and the words have um, the meaning that humans put onto them. So it really doesn't matter what we call this, it's going to have the same emotional response. And in fact, giftedness as a term can elicit a deeply emotional response from people. And that I believe is because it's greatly misunderstood in American society. A lot of people equate giftedness with imminence, achievement, and success. And in fact, anybody, gifted or not, can be imminent, high achieving, or successful. They don't hold the patent to it. I think the really important thing is that giftedness is not a value statement. And our society tends to see it as a value statement, but gifted individuals aren't better than, they're not worse than, but they are different than. And we don't give this population the respect of understanding its difference and we just lump them into grades in school and when we do that we can actually do tremendous emotional harm to these children because they are experiencing the world different whether they get good grades or not that's irrelevant they're children right right, right. and something that comes off often with parents is um, and even teachers even providers is thinking about you know how can they be so high for lack of another word how can they know so much over here but then over here there's this different quality happening so for instance we might see a child with giftedness or skills in specific areas that they're really like the little scientists and they know information and they grab it really on but then when it comes to socializing or handling their emotions there's big upsets I saw but I'd love to hear your experience mm -hmm. of it is when there is that discrepancy the kind of high and low or vice versa right. at either end, you get the in-between 
is the challenges because you're living in a body that's experiencing yes quite differences you nailed it so one of the best ways to conceptualize giftedness is asynchronous development so if you take every age in that child development book and you put it in a blender and you hit pulse every five minutes <laughs> that that actually describes the experience of these children so one of the one of the things i do like to say is giftedness is not we we don't say you're gifted in math you're gifted in english or that you actually every child gifted or not is better in some subjects than others but that giftedness is an internal experience and a way of walking through the world but if we look at a child who knows more at, at 10 years old knows more than the docent at the museum in their area of interest um, can read or do math at the 11th grade level, mm -hmm. can write at the fifth grade level, and is having a total meltdown because they have a sock wrinkle. That describes that asynchronous development. You know, they're the 40 year old lawyer, they're the docent for the, the dinosaurs, um, and yet they cannot handle sometimes, and I do want to talk about that, some of the challenges, the emotional and social challenges around them. And as hard as it is to parent and educate those kids, be many ages at once, because they don't fall into a normal development track, it's even harder to be them. So imagine being a little child who knows how to affect a situation, say it's a social situation or a um, save the wells or whatever it happens to be, but you're seven and you can't affect it, um, that causes tremendous emotional pain. I do want to say also that sometimes we look at emo these gifted children and we say, well, they're not as emotionally mature. But I also like people to sit back and think, if you are aware of things, um, very aware of the world around you and can see things that other people your age cannot, mm -hmm. and yet you have to spend all your time with people your age, is that becomes frustrating and you can act out and you can separate from your peers. The fact is, and, and I love asking my audiences this question, adults, how many of you are only friends with people your own age? No adult has ever said yes to that. And yet we put these children into a classroom and then we say they have social problems because they don't get along with the 24 people that were they were randomly put with in the classroom. It's very common that these children actually get along really well in the adult world. And to be honest, they're going to be adults for most of their life. So maybe they're ahead. And I also think that extreme emotional empathy can look like pathology when you're with um, individuals who have not reached um, that level of um, development yet. And it, it would be like putting a very active, empathetic adult into a sixth grade classroom and say, spend six hours a day with them. It would be hard for them to integrate. And it, again, it's, it, Giftedness is not a value statement, but it is a difference in being in the world and we can't pathologize or, or look at it with those normal child development eyes. We just have to look at their very complex children. And then when you add the twice exceptional, you know, the child who can, because of their dyslexia, can only read, maybe they're in fourth grade, but they can only read at second grade level, but they can actually comprehend and analyze text at the 10th grade level that child, all they see is their failures. So in school, what we need to do is be able to give them access to measure them on their strengths while at the same time remediating the weaknesses. Absolutely. It, it's so important uh, to, to kind of tease out all those differences, all those unique patterns of you know, the different qualities. And I know you were saying it's not, the quantitative, like the measurements, but mm -hmm. you know, to really think about how many complexities is one child. Yeah. And one of the consistent comments that that I hear here often is, you know, that that kind of why? Why are they doing this? How can this right. happen? This happen? Right. right? The why and the the yearning, right? For for consistency. Yes. And just something to grab onto that would yeah. feel same and familiar and predictable. Mm -hmm. Because you know, one of the main things that can get us to get in that stress response is unpredictability, right? Something we can't control. And um, so I often say it's consistently inconsistent. Mm -hmm. And getting parents to that place of how predictable it can be 
can give that ease of like, rather than saying yes. why I'm, I'm mad at you or frustrated with you, right. it's like, oh, of course, this, right. this makes sense. And so um, it's very helpful to even hear the analogies of picturing yourself as an adult, thinking yeah. of that age and getting into that classroom or thinking about that population. And, and you know, one of the things I wanna add on to exactly what you said, the number one thing I want you to take away from this is the concept of asynchronous development. And for educators and parents alone, one of the things that can reduce the stress um, in the entire household and at school is to parent and educate the child that is in front of you in the moment. So in the moment, if you are, that third grader is acting like a college professor, don't don't belittle them they they are that in that moment because they are it's very often that these children know more than the people around them again in their areas of passion maybe not necessarily what they should be learning um, but in their areas of passion because they're kids right um, but if we parent and educate the child that's in front of us the stress level for everybody goes down um, do not expect them to be one age and um, and have compassion for how it feels inside their body to be those those many different ages. Some statistics on this that they did studies on highly gifted children and what they found is most highly gifted children can learn every single thing they need to know in kindergarten through sixth grade in nine months. So these kids, it's not just that they can learn, they have a rage to learn, where if that rage is not satisfied, we start seeing behavioral challenges because it's like we are depriving them of actual oxygen and they start acting out. Um, now that doesn't mean they have the student skills. It doesn't mean that they can write a five paragraph essay in 45 minutes. It doesn't mean they can take notes, but they can absorb information. That same study actually went on to study 13 year old highly gifted individuals and they found the average 13 year old highly gifted um, individual can learn every single thing they need to know and get a perfect score on an AP test in three weeks. So I think that a lot of times people don't understand how incredible um, these minds are at taking information. Now, that doesn't mean they like school. They may be a drummer. They may be uh, an artist. They may be, they can be anything. They're, they're human beings. Um, but I think that we need to really wrap our brains around the fact that their ability to do this is different. And you, you actually talked a little bit about that behavior. One of the common things I work with in the classroom is, is for little kids, um, blurting out answers. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And for all of gifted kids, very often the teachers will complain that they're asking questions that seem unrelated. Mm -hmm. And if you, if you think about the fact that these individuals are going through life, kind of collecting information all over the place, they may be sitting in a, in a sociology class or something, and one thing the teacher says relates to that calculus problem they were thinking on, and they're actually just forming a web of information. So it's really kind of a fun exercise for both educators and parents to ask them why they ask that question, because when you ask that, it's pretty startling what they'll say, because it does relate, and we may not be able to see how it relates, but it's kind of fun. The blurting out answers, one of the things we also see is is this they're so brimming with stuff inside between their ears you know it, it, they're just kind of coming unglued and when they're young and they haven't been on earth very long it just comes out they have a really hard time so one of the like for instance one of the things we'll do is give them what i call a blurt book so we'll put a little book at their desk so we give them an off ramp for that energy coming out of their body um, so a lot of what we do is come up with solutions. Now, now, giftedness is not an excuse for bad behavior, but we can also help them through this very asynchronous time in their development by giving them off ramps for their giftedness that doesn't derail a classroom. I love the idea of the off ramp. Uh, so you're spending time with, with multiple families over the years, going into schools, um, supporting those accommodations or uh, just right interventions for the, the classroom. Yes. Uh, and then also 
at home now that we've been at home and yes. some families are familiar with their child and how this is happening and some families this might be new because now they've been exposed to seeing how their child learns yes. and, and how they're integrating the information from their their schoolwork. Well, honestly I, I will say I have about a third public school a third private school and a third home school okay. I don't think that there is any one best educational fit for any child gifted or not or to be or not there's just the fit that best fits the family and the child um, and I say the family because these kids are going to bring whatever is ailing them home and and you as as a psychologist and therapist you know that you deal with the fallout of what I call improper fit I will say in the education of my own children um, we did public school private school homeschool dual enrollment and early college and none of it was planned it was all absolutely terrifying and the schools we had to leave were not bad schools. They were fabulous, wonderful, lovely schools. But at some point, my children, um, it, it was such, such an emotionally detrimental fit. And, and we, we started to have challenges. So, so I do a lot of work with schools to help the educators and, and the staff understand um, the experience. Um, so yes, it's all over. And, and now that everybody is getting to see their kid at home, I am getting an, an awful lot of calls. <laughs> You're right. It's, how do we do this now? Um, and in fact, I, I love the term um, never waste a good crisis. And um, right now what's happening is parents are able to better understand their child, even if it's tough, it's hard. And what they're doing is they're utilizing this time to figure out their educational experience for the future. And I don't mean necessarily staying at home school, but you know, their, their kid may have all their friends at school. They desperately want to get back to school, but parents now have more information to be able to share with the educators in the classroom. We're seeing an awful lot of that. And, and in working with educators, because I'm also working with a lot of schools is teachers are so overwhelmed trying to do this right now I'm sure they're gonna be maybe a little less overwhelmed hopefully in fall if we continue into this but they're so overwhelmed what I'm finding is working with them all the resistance that sometimes I would get in a school I'm not getting that now so teachers we'll talk to them you know what are your goals for this what are you trying to do can we accomplish it can we accomplish your goals in this other manner they're saying yes and so the parents are learning the kids are learning and and I believe that the educators are learning they can let go a little bit there's more than one way to accomplish things absolutely I really hear a sense of compassion needed in all this process yes uh, and I also just, I have to say, I, I really admire and respect your statement of that the school wasn't the, the problem no. and more so that it is sometimes this trial and error of trying to find that just right fit as our children are on this continuum of development. So there's ever changing experiences, their life experiences at home, there's all of us trying to figure out those individual unique ways of learning. and. Um, you know, as we collaborate together, and that's why we're even talking today, that collaboration is so key to know that we're all on the same team. In a previous life, I was a contract negotiator. And, and I also learned very early on, everything has to be a win-win. So you can't walk in with a list of demands and expect a teacher to be able to implement them. And the, like I said, with the school, honestly and it's not a failure on anybody's part sometimes a school just doesn't fit a child um, and walking away is okay for parents sometimes um, i usually use the social and emotional as the barometer because we can do the education in many different ways but when i walk into a school we basically have to have that um, discussion with the teacher because they see in their classroom um, i'm actually working on, on a book which is kind of like a crosswalk i call it a bridge between parents and, and educators because it talks about common gifted traits and behaviors how that may manifest in the classroom how that may manifest at home because what I frequently see is parents and educators get in the room and they're talking about the same child but you wouldn't know it and and it all comes back to some of those common gifted traits and behaviors so I will say that I work with a lot of schools now that just keeps ramping up because once we get out of those meetings, those schools call me back. And so they, they start using me as a resource to work with other children in other classrooms um, because I'm not there to tell them how to treat, teach, you know, do their craft. I'm not a teacher, but I do know this population. And usually when we look through the lens of giftedness and understand the experience of the child, we can come up with a solution together.
In your experience, can you share with us some of the common behavioral traits that may come up for a child that we're speaking about? Yes, there was a there was a researcher quite some time ago. Um, his name was Kashmir Dabrowski, and he was a psychologist and a psychiatrist. And he did a study called the theory of positive disintegration. It's an extraordinarily complex theory about personality development. And while Kashmir Dabrowski, throughout his life, studied um, what he called people of higher intellect the term gifted wasn't around when he did this. This particular study was not about those individuals, but he made observations during the study and documented those observations. And a lot of people who work with the gifted population have kind of um, adopted some of that vocabulary because it helps us describe what we commonly see. So, so again, this was not a theory um, about giftedness, but um, these observations actually are very helpful to people in being able to better understand their children or their adults or their coworkers, to be honest with you. I've given this lecture and I've had deans of colleges come up and go, now I get my professors. I finally get, thank you. <laughs> you know? so, so what um, Dabrowski said is he noticed that in people of higher intellect, that in five specific areas, there were responses that seemed to be not just emotional, but seemed to kind of involve the central nervous system. And they seemed to have responses that were stronger than normal for a longer period of time than normal to stimuli that may may be small or even imperceivable by others. And in those five areas, um, the first one was, and he called them super stimulant abilities. Nobody uses that term today because mostly because nobody can spell it. And it's certainly not a spell check, I can guarantee you that. So if you wanna look up information on this, you can look up over excitabilities or intensities. Um, but in these five areas, uh, the first one was the, the physical or the psychomotor over excitability. And these are like our ping pong balls. These are the little kids that in, at kindergarten, they can never sit in one square. They need five. And they're all over the place. Um, and that energy is just coming out of their seams. They rapid speech. They never stop talking. Um, highly competitive. Um, Want to get things done. Um, they can be exhausting to be around. Um, these are the parents. I'm one of them. I've locked myself in the bathroom, turned on the water, the shower, just to, to get away for a few minutes because it's just so overwhelming. They never stop. Um, they don't, they can give up their naps super early. They have a hard time sleeping sometimes. Um, but it's due to this incredible thing going on between their ears that they just, it comes out at their seams and it comes out through their bodies. Um, so in the work that you do, what I love is that you work on grounding people, um, getting them inside their body and getting them to, to, to feel it in a way that is healthy rather than chaos. Yes. Um, and, and sometimes these kids can be mislabeled as um, hyperactive. Absolutely. They're active, but yes. it doesn't yes. mean the same thing. The second overexcitability is the imaginational overexcitability, and I call these my, my space cadets. These are the kids that are often accused of being ADHD because they're staring out the window because what's going on inside their head is so beautiful and so interesting that they have a really hard time focusing on what's immediately in front of them and what they need to learn. And these kids can often, it's interesting because these kids, these are the 13-year-old boys that are still playing dress-up. You go to Denny's and you see um, almost in every Denny's at two in the morning, you could see a whole group of people playing Dungeons and Dragons and things like that. So what may look um, when these kids are younger, like immaturity, I want to put the lens of Steven Spielberg on it. So it can look so different. Um, sometimes these kids, because they, they kind of do not like normal, may be seen as deviant. Um, or oppositional defiant, and that is actually a repulsion of normal. Mm -hmm. they, they need to create, they need to move. Um, another one is, and this is what most people think of when they think of giftedness, and that's that intellectual overexcitability. But the difference here is not that I can learn, it's that rage. It's that these are the kids um, on my youngest child when he was little, we had to actually unscrew the light bulbs in his room every night and, and hide the flashlights because he would literally read all night long. Um, textbooks, you know, he would get his older sister's textbooks and read. It, it's a rage. It's not just I can learn. It's like I, I'm going to have a nervous breakdown if I don't. So sometimes a lot of what we're trying to do is feed that intellectual beast 
if we give them intellectual stimulation in their area of interest, we often see that psychomotor um, overexcitability go down. It calms them. So the brain just needs it. Another one is the sensual overexcitability, and that can look like and have an overlap of children on the spectrum. Um, but, but this is that the kids that cover their ears, that can't handle touch or need touch, um, this can often show up in food. Some of these kids can only eat spicy food. Some of them won't eat anything with flavor whatsoever. Texture in food. The lights are too bright. Um, fluorescent lights are, are in every single classroom and they can hear the buzz and they can see the flicker. So they're stroking out, being told to learn something they already know. And so they act out um, because they're little kids. And the last one is the emotional overexcitability. And this is the one that Dabrowski saw most prevalent. And I will say those of us who work with this population see it the most too extraordinarily intense emotions. And if you think about that internal experience and feeling that world in a very intense coming at you way, um, and that asynchronous development, that's what you see. Um, we see these kids, one of the, the one of the common traits we see is these kids have a hard time on the playground. Somebody broke the rules. Um, they have a very hard time dealing with the unfairness that comes with being a child. And that's developmentally appropriate. You're a rule follower and everybody should um, play by the rules and you can't see why anybody would be mean to each other. They'll, they'll have these breakdowns. Um, but this emotional intensity can look very, um, very, very um, intense, especially for parents. Thank you for laying out these five areas. It's very helpful in order to see all the complex complexities of each of these children. And I know for me as a clinician, I get excited to welcome that child into the office. I can see so many ways to support the whole bod body in terms of using creativity, in terms of using play, in terms of using intellect, and also to support parents and the child to look at how this manifests in the body, what it looks like, and how to kind of see as it's coming up um, and, and to be able to support all those individual moments. So it's very helpful to hear. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm really I'm happy to share it. Um, I think this population, like I said, is misunderstood. And if we just relax into the fun and, and the chaos, it's joy and challenge. Um, you can just have a fabulous ride. You know, uh, these are traits that are shared by all humans. Again, gifted individuals do not hold a patent to that. And not all gifted individuals experience them all, but they're very common. And, and if, we, if we look at a child a gifted or to each child, when they start exhibiting behaviors that are different, if we put this lens on and try to find where it's coming from, then we can better parent and educate them. Yes, absolutely. How can individuals, families, educators find you? They can find me actually directly through my email. Um, my email is the, T-H-E, Sharon, S-H-A-R-O-N, Duncan, D-U-N-C-A-N, at gmail.com, or they can find information about uh, me through giftedidentity.com. If you Google gifted research and outreach grow, I actually have a nonprofit where we're doing some physiological research to try to understand why these bodies respond to the world different, um, what is actually happening. Um, there was a study done not all that long ago that showed that this population is um, up to triple the autoimmune disease. I mean, if you think of stress responses and things such as that, um, we don't know why. Um, but I realized that we didn't even get to talk about the research side. I very much want to look at and, sh and explore the patterns that I see yes. even in the body. Yes. So more to talk about for sure. Lovely. Well, thank you so much. Thank I you, really, Lori. I appreciate I really it. Really helpful for so many parents to just start to see children and, and ask the question and that there are incredible resources like yourself. Um, there are, and there's a lot of resources out there. And a lot of what I do is actually connect parents to resources and resources that are safe and won't pathologize them for the traits that need to be just handled gently. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. Thank again. you. We'll talk soon. It's been a pleasure. Bye-bye. <laughs>